Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, you're gonna get all of our reactions from Beta Weekend number two. We've also got some great news and a lot of other posts from the developers. Stay tuned, it's gonna be a long show. Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria, your one-stop shop for Guild Wars 2 news, insight, strategy, and discussion. Uh, we are almost live from the Order of Whisper... I mean an undisclosed location somewhere in Lion's Arch. Uh, we're glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or three, won't you? Uh, we are... Uh, very happy to have this this awesome episode we're going to be able to bring you guys here from the end of Beta Weekend event number two. Let me introduce myself. I am Bridger. I am the host of the show. And let me introduce the rest of our colleagues here going around. Great. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey, glad to be back again. Absolutely. Looks like your, uh, your audio quality and video quality is sounding much better now. Uh, Freelancer also joining us, the leader of Team Legacy, featured very heavily this weekend. Hello, sir. Uh, how you doing, Bridger? I'm not bad at all. Not bad at all. Vega, I know you got a couple of hours in at the end, tail end of the beta weekend. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Awesome. All right. We got a ton of stuff to talk about here. Let me see. Uh, first, I very quickly want to thank Zachary, Brian, Mike, and David for donating recently. If you'd like to donate, head to talesofteria.com. There's a little donate button on the right-hand side. Feel free, but do not feel obligated. Um, also, I wanted to apologize. We had a really awesome intro last week, and I, uh, I, <laughs> I pronounced the guy's name Bjorn when every idiot knows it's Bjorn. Apparently everybody knows that because they all emailed me and said, "Hey, it's it's definitely Bjorn. It's it's Swedish. It's Bjorn, you know." <laughs> or or so anyway. Sorry about that, Bjorn. But I uh, wanted to give credit where credits credits due. What you may have just seen if you're watching the live stream there is the March of the Golems. And if you haven't seen that, check it out, ladies and gentlemen. It is awesome. That's where we're going to start and world versus world because we have some awesome stories to tell you guys. So, Freelancer, why don't you tell us the story? How did that ridiculousness, a hundred golems marching across the borderlands, how did that come to pass? That was one of the spur of the moment. Um, we have no idea what we're going to do for the rest of the night with the server matchups being broken. <laughs> and I'm sitting on 400-something gold, and, you know, what the heck are we going to do? Um, and that's really what, it's, what it was. It was like... What can we do that's crazy? So we throw out ideas. Mass trebuchets. Okay, well, you set up 100 trebuchets. They can fire. I mean, where are you going to you know, where are you gonna fire at? Um, you can hit the Citadel, but then eventually they'll kill them. So uh, it just seems so much cooler than instead of doing trebuchets to do golems. So we got all of the players, all of the Alliance members, Edge, Pain Train, um, Subterfuge was there, uh, LOTD, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different guilds were there. And uh, we're like, all right, we need help. We're going to go to this keep. We're going to port to all the different zones because we had the whole map. Every every keep in the entire world was um, keep teleporting back in and build all these. So we laid down a, um, 100 blueprints. Um, I sent some blueprints to some of the other guild members as well, and we blew through all of our money and laid down 100 blueprints. And I still had like 100 more. You look, check out my stream. You can see it. Uh, I had about 200 blueprints on me, and I could have bought more. But we didn't have enough supply, and we ran out of people because everybody was hopping in the golems. But it was a blast. Everybody, I think, had a, a huge amount of fun. Um, I think the coolest thing, uh, what do you think, Bridger, the, the water scene, right? Absolutely. The, yeah, water, the water was great. Watching a hundred golems, you know, take on crate <laughs> with melee attacks, no less, because they're swimming around. Yeah, uh, was amazing. Um, it was it was really fun. But um, 
you know, aside from the World v. World things breaking, we did end up getting paired up against Darkhaven, so that was a lot of fun. That was a nice even match. I uh, had a lot of good battles there. Um, but, you know, we, you make do with what you can. It is beta after all, right? Yeah, and, and so a lot of people are saying, hey, um, it's it's pretty there, – there, there are at least three different posts that I've seen that have posted this video and go, proof – that's that world versus world is unbalanced or that it's pay to win oh absolutely all this other stuff. you know i've gotten mail uh i've gotten direct mail i've i got one piece of mail i think it's through tales of Teria feedback uh people calling me a hacker people <laughs> calling uh just saying that you know using some cer certain hacks to get gold it's amazing it really is and to me that's a compliment it really is like i love being called a hacker i really do <laughs> because it's just that's the best compliment slash insult you can give somebody you know and um but yeah it's you know we must have accumulated over 800 something gold over the weekend we had all this money to spend i posted in a, a guru thread um about it because no i don't think any guild should be able to just build 100 golems at will there has to be caps there i mean we had a lot of fun and stuff but in a real scenario i mean we were teleporting to doors you remember the record we broke there bridger yeah Two-second uh, door. <laughs> exactly. The two-second door. I mean, we teleported 100 golems, or as many we can get on top of that portal. Took down a door, and a reinforced door, no less, mind you. Um, a reinforced door in about, it was about, realistically, about five seconds. No exaggeration. And that's just insane. Now, the counter to that would be Balliste, but you, you can't really see a portal coming, you know? So you can't really set up Balliste effectively, and that's just, it seemed a little overpowerful. Now... Is that a normal strategy that everybody should do? Of course not. That was the Is most it inefficient you even thing. Can do? I mean, it, it, let's assume it, that we no. were playing against a server that was actually fighting us, and we had to use supply to a repair and upgrade keeps after we had taken them. Also, re-attack and retake keeps that have been taken from us. We need supply to build siege engines and all that stuff. I don't think you could get ten thousand supply together in order to build that many golems in a in an even matchup. No, you could and and realistically, I don't think any any guild in a real matchup with half a brain would have done that. Uh, that was just you know we had a bunch of Reddit comments and stuff like well, this sh clearly shows Team Legacy is nub, you know, because <laughs> they build a they build a hundred golems when they could have just built two catapults. It's like, are you kidding me, man? You know, <laughs> really? You know, you, they, tried to you make You obviously that didn't get it, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we did it for no, the lulls. All right. I think, we had I think that individually in... though, golems. Yeah, I did it for the lulls. I think individually, golems aren't even worth a hundred supply. I mean, even one golem. Uh, there were so many things you could do better uh, that I, I was watching guilds do. Two catapults on a sidewall, for example, mm -hmm. is far more efficient than building a golem at the front door. Um, it's just in any realistic <laughs> so, scenario. So Freelancer uh, is, has gone and proved how ridiculous 100 golems is and then goes, yeah, but they're really not worth it. Buff golems, please. <laughs> <laughs> they really do need a buff, though. I mean, what? think about what you could do with the trebuchet at 100 supply versus a golem. I mean... I don't know, but anyways, I, I but golems agree look a though. lot cooler. I, yeah, golems look cooler, and contrary to what everybody was saying, I'm pretty sure the red glow that everybody was asking about, that's red for everybody. If I if I understand it right, it's just if it's glowing red, then somebody's in it. If it's blue, then somebody's not in it. That's all that meant. It it just happens to be the color that power stones glow when they're activated. That's that's a little lore for you right there. <laughs> Yeah. So well, we found out one little trick as well, and this does need a nerf. Is the golems have this shield that they can cast, mm -hmm. and it um, and it, I guess it makes them invulnerable or something. Did you did you check that out, Bridger? I didn't I didn't examine it myself, but does it simply block all projectiles? But maybe yep. things inside so, the shield can still take damage. From what it say, what I what I heard from some people was that it it blocks just projectiles to yourself. Other people are saying it just it's a bubble for anybody around you. So that may be something to look at. Thank anybody should be building golems right now until they get a nerf or a buff in terms of what they can do. I mean, let's imagine a golem with like a scorpion wire. You can just grab people off of walls or something. <laughs> just something like that, you know? <laughs> That'd yeah. be entertaining. All kinds of things. Um, so that was a ton of fun. Now, the devs had mentioned and you were just commenting on the fact that we didn't really have very many even matchups. We had we fought Darkhaven on Friday and that was that was yep. a tough fight. We had to really go above and beyond to make sure everything was in the right place and and they managed to to fight us off for a good long time. And 
After that, though, and on Friday, we got teamed up with a brand new server. I think it was a big mistake for them to just say, wipe the slate clean and make everybody the same. The brand new server should have been matched up against each yeah. other, not so against first, others. Yeah, so our first matchup was against Darkhaven. Now, if you remember, Darkhaven was the server that that fought with us neck and neck and neck and they ended up coming up all top dark haven was also the server that we created our dreaming bay video against that was mm -hmm. the reddit guys um and again it was the reddit guys this time around and it was it was incredible because it was they took half the map and in the first matchup this last weekend we thought okay they might actually overcome us like they did last time so we ended up popping in all the different team speak channels using commander chat again with the alliance members um Another guild, uh, LOTD, was coming in our, our server as well. Another new alliance member, and we're all just like, look, we got to do something. So we started splitting in all these groups. Um, and it was amazing when you take that divide and conquer mentality. You know, instead of running around in 50 man Zerg, splitting up into 20 man groups or 15 man groups. So instead of having two giant, you know, masses amount of people that we seem to see Darkhaven running around with, we took these, um, you know, smaller groups with, instead and just split on, on all the different maps. And before you knew it, not only did we take Darkhaven, uh, uh, basically we took part of the map in the middle out, but we took the entire map from them. And that was just a huge morale boost because this was the server that beat us last time, the only server. Um, but that was big. But then after that, we faced uh, Emery Bay. There was a lot of arena net devs on there. Um, I whispered a few of them, had a chat with how the imbalance was, and it was at that moment I had guild members starting to PM us about the arena net post that we all saw where um, the server matchups weren't exactly working right. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, in that third matchup, as we all saw, and I'm sure Fort Aspenwood saw pictures of them, Jade Quarry, these other big World v. World servers, um, they had the same issue. They were getting paired up with these brand new servers that had maybe 100 people, 500 people on them. And it was just a complete steamroll. So you're right. In any typical scenario, we wouldn't have been able to build all those golems and stuff. But, it, you know, it was fun to kick off the beta with. Great. Did you play in the uh, in the world versus world? Yeah, I got a chance to hop in for a bit. What was your favorite, I, what was your favorite part? Did you notice any major changes? What, what happened? Um, I just thought... At least uh, player-wise, like our strategies and stuff were definitely a lot more fine-tuned uh, overall. And probably my favorite part was uh, we were running around just doing stuff on one of the borderlands, and there's about five of us in this group. And all of a sudden, we're like, "Oh, we gotta check out this tower. It's under attack." And it ends up being like a group of 20 to like 30, you know, invaders. And we're like, "Oh, snap! We gotta defend this keep." But we've been upgrading the keep, so like it's got oil, it has like a cannon on it, and we like get the defenses. We put an arrow card somewhere. And we end up holding off this, like, crazy attack for about, like, 10 minutes or so. And we actually end up wiping them. And it shows, like, these the insane things you can do with, uh, with like, upgraded, like, sort of keeps and good, like, tactics to sort of yeah. take care of Zergs and stuff. And that story and similar, I think, is what ended up um, at the very end of the beta night. We ended up forming five to eight-man groups, what we called on-the-fly uh, interceptor squads. And I think that's a very real thing. I think what we're going to do next time and what... Um, um, something I think will really help us against these Zerg servers um, is to form a strategy and develop strategies centered around five to eight people that can take out 30, 40 man Zergs. Um, we, we actually did it on the fly towards the end of the uh, Sunday night, right before our big guild event. And uh, it was it was hilarious. It, it's so exhilarating when you're part of five to eight people and you're setting up siege equipment in such a way or in such a, a fashion in different spots of the keep that can hold off 40 people. It's it's amazing. I, I like that the defenses actually do work that way, and it's not a, well, numbers win no matter what kind of a thing. I, I, I like that cannons are actually effective. Like, I, when I first saw that these keeps were going to have, like, boiling oil and cannons and mortars and things like that, I was just thinking to myself, yeah, but how effective can they be? I mean, aren't they just going to get destroyed really quick? But you have to destroy them really quick. Like, if you're the attacking force, those cannons can really wipe out a whole group with that, like, everybody's firing at the door and nobody notices the guy jump on the cannon and everybody else just keeps firing at the door unless they're on team speak and they're telling people hey help us we're down in the back or what have you you can you can wipe out the good chunk of the force and then just finish them off yourself those cannons are great the boiling oil is only very good for when you get guys right up against the door for trying to take out the 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 rams or anything like that but yeah that that Oh, I can't wait to, to get some more into World versus World against against other big servers. That was that was so much fun. Um, and did you did uh did you guys go into like the little mini the new mini dungeon oh, area? Oh man, we so did. Are we gonna jump into that now? Cause I got a special video for that if I can find it.
Uh, Might as well. All right. I, uh, World I didn't. Related, right? I uh, the closest I got to dungeons was doing the jumping puzzle in one of the Borderlands, and everybody on my stream, I had about 150 watching on the stream, was watching me epically fail on this jumping puzzle. <laughs> I I could not do a jumping puzzle to save my life. So this is. I'm, I'm just gonna show some. Oh, there's our full cap. <laughs> this was on Friday, uh, right after Darkhaven finally left. This is actually the moment when we when we when we capped everything on the map. It, it almost. It felt like a like I was mentioning earlier. It felt like a total war moment. Like if anybody's played Total War, morale is very important in the Total War games. If you manage to do enough damage to a single thing, like cavalry charge into a unit that's already been fighting for a long time or something like that, um, you can break them and they start running. And that lowers the morale of everybody around them and they might break and start running. And in World vs. World, it's, okay, if you knock somebody out uh, so hard that they just think it's not even worth going back again, and then somebody else comes in and goes, wow, we have nothing, it's not worth fighting for, and they leave, then it just, nobody came in the rest of the night. So this is what we did. We jumped into the... Uh, the world versus world jumping puzzle. This is the bane of my existence right there. I finally made that stupid jump. But uh, this is the most intense feeling you can imagine. Like, I kept thinking, when is this going to end? When is this going to end? When am I going to get to the top? When am I going to be at safety? I don't know. It's too... Ah! Ah! It's just a little further. I can feel it. I didn't want to look up because I didn't want to see, like, 100 feet more of this nonsense. So <laughs> this, is, this, is, this was so much fun. Did you, who, did you guys all do this? Vega, did you do this? No, I didn't do any World v. World. Oh, this I thing did. is so cool. I wanted to, but... Did you, play, did you play through this one great? I actually didn't get a chance to do this. All I right. wanted to give it a shot, but I was never in the area. So, you know, they mentioned how you can have, like, the, the traps that people can set off and everything. Uh, there's actually an Indiana Jones-style moment where there's this long downslope, and then you go to do something else, and you have to go down this. And further on in the dungeon, you can go up onto this platform where you can see the big downslope, and you can trigger boulders to fall behind people and roll down on them. And then at the same time... <laughs> There are other controls in that same area where you can get to, like, make spikes pop up on these platforms that people have to jump across. And then there's another one that makes fire breathe out. So this is the big thing I'm talking about right here. If somebody's over on one of these other platforms, boulders will roll down behind you in Indiana Jones style. Dun, 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 get out of the way. So... This, there was just so many cool, clever traps that we didn't really get to try except against each other by accident. Because I didn't know what they did. I'm like, what does this do? And I see, like, boulders going down after... I'm like, oh, God, Gever, get out of there! Behind you! Sorry! Sorry! By, by accident, he says. <laughs> and, wink, wink. And, uh, by the way, that Ride the Lightning is so useful in this whole thing. Um, and right there, those little heads had fire in them. Uh, so, and, oh, there was just so many cool things that you could do to the people coming along behind you in this map. Now, what they did give, however, is they gave the people, um, uh, basically, they, they made the platform that you can see uh, to the left there um, completely open and far enough away that you can't really attack the people that are on the trap controls, but you can throw very conveniently placed boulders at them to try to knock them off the trap controls and back to the beginning of the whole level. So that I thought was very clever. Like, yeah, okay, what are, the, what are these five boulders just doing right here? Oh, I wonder what I can use that for. So, oh, that was so cool. And this is like the very beginning of it. And remember they mentioned something about the dark room? I mean, there we go. This oh, is wow. the dark room. And, oh, by the way, <laughs> traps in this one as well. <laughs> and every, now you have to grab, we, we, there was like people trying to do this room, and they found out, they're like, what the hell? And they're trying to cast spells to see where they were going, and somebody finally figured out, hey guys, there's like torches at the f start of this room where you can get, pick them up and then you can see, and I'm just failing horribly right here. Even though I did this room like 16 times. I had to go back to help somebody, and when I came back to do it this time, I failed completely. I was like, where do I go? Derp, da derp. I've only done it six times before. So, now, what we saw at the end, actually, was uh, a ton of really cool rewards. You get some gear, some leveled gear for your particular level, and you also get uh, a couple of different blueprints. Um, and that includes, actually, by the way, the possibility of getting a trebuchet or a golem, which are like, what, a gold each? Something to that effect? Yep. So that's actually pretty big time loot. It might only be a small chance, but I know somebody that did get a trebuchet out of the chest at the end of this thing. They also mentioned that you could reset this uh, once every 24 hours. This seems like a fun thing to do um, if, uh, you know, you're ever feeling just bored with World vs. World. It's just, it's just goofy fun, man. I had so much fun. I'm going to turn it off so that people don't just see the whole 
um, the whole solution to everything now. But I, I, oh, if you want to see more, I, I can. Uh, that's on my stream, twitch.tv slash bridger15. There should be a, a good chunk of it put on there already. So, wow. Okay. Um, what else did we have here? Uh, let's see. The gathering nodes. This is something I read on the, um, on the dev forums. And this is actually something that they mention a couple of times. Now there are gathering nodes in World vs. World. Uh, and now, uh, Freelancer, did you use the Mystic pick to grab all those while you were running around? Yeah, we op I opened up a lot of the Mystic chests because as I was flipping other things in the market, I found that the, the gem prices were also being outrageously going up and down between 15 and 30 silver. Um, so I ended up buying a lot of the gems and then exchanging them. And I, I opened up a few chests because I'm curious. As, um, yeah, I'm looking for ways to make more money and sort of uh, find broken parts in the system, right? Um, so I figure, okay, well, maybe if I buy, uh, it was, let's see, it was 15 silver for 125 gems, which gives you one mystic key, which has a 50% chance you can use it twice. You know? So I opened up chests, and I opened up another chest, another chest, and I'm finding all these little quirky items in them. Um, one of the items that comes, or two of the items that come out of these chests are mystic, uh, like there's a mystic axe and a mystic pick. Um, it should be that a you cannot sickle as well. I think for harvesting I, food. I never maybe, got one. And I opened not. up maybe eighty chests. Okay, um, so maybe there isn't one. So I'm not saying there isn't, but I, out of eighty chests, I never got one. Um, so out of axes and picks, I got tons of picks and just very few axes. When you chop down or you gather uh, like ore or nodes with these, you get like special items also. Like you're guaranteed to get items. So every time I hit a like an ore node, I would always get a gem or something with it or two gems sometimes. It was incredible. So then I started doing the math, and um, I haven't quite finished my spreadsheets yet, but – you know, I'm thinking in my head, okay, Mystic Pick, which is you get, let's say, I got about 30% out of the time out of a chest. If I gather all of these uh, with 25 uses, if I gather all of these nodes and get all these gems and then sell those on the market, do I make my money back plus some? And I ended up doing just that. It was very interesting. But Mystic Picks and Mystic Axes, those are huge. I mean, you could – Chop anything. First off, you didn't have to worry about level. You yeah. can just ran, normally ran you'd have to be level something. eighty to get some of the stuff in World versus World, like in the internal exactly. battlegrounds. So you can you can go up and hit anything and gather anything in World v World. Didn't matter what it was. And on top of that, you always got incredibly expensive gems and stuff with that. Um, and it was really really interesting. It almost makes me think that the biggest item everybody will be buying or going after with a gem store is not to be blowing money on dies and, and bank slots, et cetera, but actually to get these mystic items and then turn around and sell what you get for a profit. Um, I, I, have to, you have to, I have to remind everybody, though, we were all given 2,000 gems. It completely, 2,500 gems, I should say, it completely absolutely. tanked the market for gems, right? I mean, everybody was turning their gems into gold, and it started at 30 silver and shot down on the first day to 15, and it never really recovered from that because nobody had to pay for those 2,000 gems that they got. So so there was much more of them than there normally would be. So I'd imagine that the actual value of gems might be, uh, I don't know, 30 to 50 silver per 100 at least, if not a little higher than that. We'll have to see what it actually winds up coming down to when yeah. people are willing to pay for. It bounced between um, – because if I wasn't in World v. World, um, I was doing – I was sitting right there in Lion's Arch at the market. You saw me there, Bridger. I was <laughs> – I basically lived immersion. there because I, I, I just had my eyes glued on, you know, the – one thing I also noticed is that there were a lot of, uh, you know, we mentioned economy and flipping and stuff like that, but a lot of people listing items for one copper just to get rid of it, and they don't realize that you could also turn around and sell that to a vendor for seven copper or one silver. So yeah. a lot of my time, and I'm saying this because I don't want people doing it. It's, 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 it's it breaks an education the market. thing. These things, th this kind of ways of making piles and piles of money will go away as the game matures and people understand I hope so. more about it. I hope so. Um, you know, so we, I was buying weapons left and right for one copper piece, turning right around, going to the vendor and selling them for three silver. And I did that a couple thousand times and it was pretty <laughs> insane on top of the actual, uh, taking advantage of the buy sell orders. But, you know, people are saying, you know, how'd you make all this money? Well, it's, it's because of you, <laughs> you know, listing it for one <laughs> copper. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of good things. I, I like the system overall. There was a lot of other, like, for example, I tried playing around with it the final night before you'd completely crushed all my hopes and dreams with your sellout <laughs> moment. But I found, for example, the tiny totem was a perfect item to deal with because 
Um, the buy orders, people were only you know putting up buy orders for about three copper for tiny totems. And this is something that's very useful in leveling up artificing specifically. Um, and so they were willing to buy it for three copper, but people um, were like basically uh, buying it from sellers for 37 copper. So I put up a buy order for 500 of these things at four copper and I flipped them around and sold them to people that were looking to simply get the item now instead of waiting. Like all, I didn't even have to wait either. That was the ridiculous part. I put it up there for four copper and I got 500 of these things in must be 20 minutes. My whole buy order was done. So that's all people had to do was put up a buy order and they would have gotten it. Instead, what they were doing was going to the market and buying from the person immediately who was selling for 37 copper. So that's the reason the market was so wide right there is because nobody knew what they, what they were doing with, the car, with regards to the market, which, you know, people, this is a new market. Unless you've played games like EVE, you might not know how buy and sell orders work, which is why we're going to have a making money video coming up after the third beta weekend. I'm going to wait because the user interface on it seems incomplete, and I was thinking about making one this way, beta weekend, but I didn't want to make one and have it be completely outdated. So, um... Anyway, the point is, I bought 500 of these things and then started selling them for, you know, 36 copper, and the market crashed a little bit, because I guess other people found out the same thing, and it, it started crashed. going down, so I, I took my 36 copper down, because I sold about 50 at that, so I basically made back my investment already, and then I sold them at 25, and then the market went down a little more, it was stabling out about 20, and maybe it went down to 50. Freelancer comes in and sells 1,700 of them for 7 copper, and I'm like... <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> that was just one item. I, was, I, I saw the 1700 I suddenly with. show up and Freelancer's like, yeah, I'm trying to sell a bunch of stuff to make some money. I was like, Freelancer! <laughs> is, the, is the market cross-server? I don't remember. Yes, all servers. It's all, That's why servers? everything was selling yeah. and buying so fast. But even after he did that, the market recovered in about an hour or so, and all 500 of mine sold at 10 copper. So I still bought it for and sold at 10. So I still doubled my money there, even if you take into account the, the auction expenses. But see, within that next hour, Bridger, I had already bought another 8,000 of them. <sighs> so, <laughs> I mean, That's okay, you sold, you sold your 500 in the next well, hour. Well, yes, but, but I, I had only had like a gold and me. a half worth of seed money, man. You had people sending you gold all weekend. I had to make my own by going around and, <laughs> and finding every location in the Ashford Plains in order for it to give me like a half a, half a, half a gold. <laughs> you're, you're like the mom and pop store and exactly. I was the Walmart. The freaking Walmart. It's always the Walmart. That's a good example, yeah. So, yeah. one of the reasons I brought up the gathering nodes is because I noticed a very interesting post by one of the devs uh, that basically said, node placement in world versus world is not random. They actually work exactly like this. The northern third of the borderlands has tier one material, so like copper and things like that. The middle section of the borderlands has tier two, like iron and softwood instead of uh, greenwood, etc., etc. The south has tier three. Eternal Battlegrounds has tier four stuff around the outside, tier five closer to the castle, and tier six scattered around in very limited quant qualities. Uh, quantities. Now, these things require certain levels to get. I think tier one, you can get immediately all the copper stuff and, and the softwood. Uh, tier two stuff, you need, I think, level 15, if I'm not mistaken, to get an iron pick, or maybe it's level 10, somewhere around there. And then I think around level 20, you get a steel pick, etc., etc. And so what that meant is if you were going to be playing in world versus world and you're a low, lower level character, the better place for you to be is in the Eternal Battlegrounds get anything and just every time you're going from place to place if you see a node just like tell your whole guild hey everybody stop for three seconds and click this thing and we're all going to make a ton of money as a guild and that's actually what one of the devs said is world of uh, world v world is balanced money wise with the understanding that people that are running through it are going to be gathering things as they go and one of the devs said they made like 70 silver in a couple of hours easy just alone from stopping every once in a while and gathering things so uh then other people in the thread are going, I don't want a PvE while I'm PvPing. Um, I don't know what to respond to that about. <laughs> I just don't that know. Actually, that actually makes sense, though, like how they made the money, because I remember there was a point where we ran out of money, because like, I was spent my whole purse like trying to upgrade keeps and stuff, and we were like, we need more money, we need more money, and we're like, well, let's go gather some stuff while we're running around, and we would sell it on the trading house, and of course, probably freelancer was there buying it from us, for, like, ridiculously low. <laughs> so, like, I had was... to, I had to chew out my guild members, because they were, like, I had all the ores, you know, iron, copper, silver, and I had them all at 
you know, these prices. And people and were going and buying, guild members were going and buying. I'm like, stop it. You know, I could just give you the ore and stuff. And so, <laughs> and like when we were assigning uh, upgrade teams, and can't really go into specifics, but we had groups of people dedicated to running around in circles, upgrading everything on the map. And like, poor great, send, sending me whispers, you know, I need gold, I need gold. <laughs> so, and I was getting that from 10 other people at the same time. So I'm like, I can't do this. And it, half my <laughs> half my time in World v World was watching people attack the door. Why I'm sending mail, you know, with with like two gold to five gold at a time. Like so much gold was going out to my groups, but it worked. I mean, it showed it showed that it, it does work. We had every tower, every keep, fully upgraded, fancy walls, everything. So it was it was nice. I just imagine a uh, freelancer in a in a in a war tent with his, you know, <laughs> bent over a table, and somebody comes in and says, General Whisperwind, yes, we've had a message from the Outer Recon Control. What is it? Have they spotted something? They're out of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what oh, it was. Oh, fine, it's, have it this parcel, take it to them, get it. Get... <laughs> it was never a message from Great saying, hey, we need some help over here. It was, or hey, we're doing great. It was, hey, I need gold. <laughs> I need more gold. <laughs> it was so, and it was so many people doing that, but yeah, well, it was good times. Let me, let me bring this around because a lot of people have, that would now probably get to this point and ask this. Assuming that uh, you know you're a smaller guild or, or just somebody that doesn't know how to make a lot of money and or, or just a server that doesn't have the kind of people like you that can play the market that know what they're doing, is this a pay to win scenario? I mean can you can you deny that, for example, us upgrading the doors, upgrading the keeps, making the guards stronger, adding guards to patrols, didn't that help us win world versus world? Uh, I got to say, speaking on that point, that guard upgrades we were given a major buff. I mean, did you see uh, when they upgraded the number of guards, how many were sitting mm -hmm. in front of each door? That was that was incredible. Plus, the upgrades on guards, like the level, when you when you upgrade first the number, then the level of guards, level 83 guards, one level 83 zealot guard, which was a new mm -hmm. one, by the way. A lot of people didn't realize that was added in. Um, you know, with the giant greatsword, it's a char, and there's two of them in front of keeps, there's one of them in front of towers. They can solo three people by themselves. That's incredible. Um, so the the big, big point that we tried to make this beta was that instead of going point to point, taking all these different areas like a Blitzkrieg, uh, let's assign people to do upgrades as well. That way when we face Darkhaven, they can't come up behind us and take everything back. And it worked, but it required a lot of money. Each day, we must have spent... Uh, shoot, maybe we had 12, maybe something groups going. We must have spent at least 150 gold each day um, just on upgrades, just sending out upgrades uh, money nonstop. And it's, it's a lot of money. So a smaller guild, you got to consider two things, Bridger. A smaller guild is not going to have 12 groups running around, you mm -hmm. know, or 10 groups running around, uh, or even eight or so. You know, there was times we only had about six or eight. Um, would you so say, that's, would that's that 150 be including our alliance guilds as well? Yes. Okay. So it's um, more like it's it's our entire guild of 120 plus people that we're on plus what two other guilds that were on our server. Residents yeah, I, I was it, right? sending money to alliance members as well, just because they're alliance members. You know, they're family. So um, you know, I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page, and you don't you don't want to be the only guild running around doing all the cool things with golems and stuff. So um, you know, a big part of server you know coordination and and getting that family that sense of server pride is helping out your other guilds on the server. But so, yeah, we sent a lot of money out to the other guild members that asked for it, or other guilds that asked for it, and the officers there. So but, um, let me ask this question. Uh, great, you were in one of those uh, running around upgrading things, right? Yeah. Um, did you ever come across something other people that were paying for it? Or was, like, the Ascension Alliance the one bankrolling the entirety of our server the whole time? I feel like I ran into keeps and there was stuff already on the way. So like we didn't capture anything. We would show up later on mm -hmm. and it would be ours. And sometimes an upgrade would be going. So I don't know if that was like an ascension group or it could have been like a random group. There were some random groups running around on our borderlands and stuff, you know, capturing things. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out. So so let's say you know let's take Freeze's idea of like 150 per day. Uh, and 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 now this is probably inflated anyway because you wouldn't be resetting every day and needing to re-upgrade everything every time. But maybe That's you right. would need to re-upgrade it if an enemy took it and you took it back. You'd need to re-upgrade it. But let's say maybe 150, 200 gold per day. Over the entirety of World versus World, 
I'm guessing that's probably going to be generated by the players. They're probably going to be generating that much gold, both from, you know, getting the, the nodes and from killing other players and getting the rewards, you know, on a massive scale, hundreds and hundreds of players. They're probably going to be 150 or more gold being flowing into players. So uh, the, or, I disagree no. on that, Bridger. You don't think so? Yeah, the entirety of Team Legacy, you know, we were recording um, via the spreadsheets I had, um, donated about 70 to 80 gold the entire weekend. That was a total of all the golds, you know, sent. Uh, on top of that, if you include all the mats that were donated here and there, um, it wasn't a lot. So smaller guilds are going to have that real problem if they if they aren't paying attention to the markets. They're not trying to make a profit via the market because I hate to break it to people. That is its own game. It really is. you got to have somebody in your guild that knows how to manipulate that game because then people like me will manipulate you, and that's not right. You know, you need to have people that are aware of what's going on in the, the economy. More, the more people in the game world that know how the economy works, the less money Freelancer makes. So let's put it that the, way. Well, the more <laughs> my, well, I like to think of it the more money that everybody makes, and, and you have better battles out in World v. World, so we can't throw 100 golems out there you know, and, and do that. You, know, there, you shouldn't be able to do that. We shouldn't have been able to afford that. And if there were more players, and this is beta too, so I digress. You know, this, this is beta. But if there are more players trying to play the market as well, then it might not have been as bad. Because you gave a perfect example, Bridger, that the buy order for small totems was, what, five copper, three copper, something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's three or four copper. And then people were looking to instant buy it for about 37 copper. That's broken right there. That market is extremely inflated. It should not be like that. When more people are paying attention to it, I don't think we'll ever run into that problem. No. The, the, the most stable. Market, yep. You, you're just I was just about to say, yep. You, you were heading right where I was. The, the most stable market I saw, and the reason being because everybody wanted to build armor and weapons, was the copper market. Copper ore was trading at about 22 copper, selling out, and then the instant buy was 23 copper. Right there is a stable market that somebody cannot exploit, and that's how every item should be. And I think once we play into live and more people level up, you know, and more people have a lot more crafting going on, it's going to get like that, and guilds like Team Legacy are not going to be able to blow 100 gold on golems. I think things will balance out. I don't think anything should be really changed right now because this is beta, and let's, I mean, let's be honest, how many people were really concentrating on crafting in beta? Probably not many, right? Not many, I don't think no. so. Yeah, whereas in launch, you're going to be concentrating on it because it's your character, and, and the time and the money you're spending is going to be Permanent. permanent, you know, you're gonna exactly. feel like you're gonna feel like you're accomplishing something. So, we'll see. Come launch, I don't think anything should be really changed now. I think the markets will be a lot more stable come launch. So, uh, I'm going, getting back to the point, if we agree that upgrading keeps and towers and everything costs a lot of gold, and that it's very useful to do, and it definitely helps your server. I think it helped our server a lot when we, when the reinforced doors alone are worth like way more money than we actually put into it, I think is probably the most cost-efficient thing you can possibly do. Um, doesn't that mean servers that have people willing to spend money to get something instead of time might be more effective in World versus World? I mean, that's the argument that so, some people would make. So you're getting back to the main point the, that, the, I, that I went off on. Um, so... Does money – is it pay to win? Is it um, pay to win in that sense? I just want to get a, an idea from each of you because this I, is what people are asking on the forums. I don't think it's – see, pay to win is, is under the pretense that if you have – if I have $100 to blow on Guild Wars 2, that I could put that $100 and automatically win. I still think you have to have standing armies out in World v. World. You have to have the organization. You have to know how to set up siege equipment because I'll tell you something, Bridger. If, if let's say X server, let's say Jade Quarry, you know, another big World v. World server, has all this money. They fully upgrade everything. Me and my other raid officer – uh, Soul Stitch, we're just going to laugh. I mean, because it doesn't change the fact that we know how to siege those areas correctly, where if you have a reinforced door or a reinforced wall, okay, <laughs> you know, you wasted your money. <laughs> so it, it, it's it, pay to win would assume that if I blew all of this money on this keep, you know, or if I blew all the money on this entire zone, that I could leave it alone almost or leave a skeleton crew there and it would sort of defend itself. And I don't think that's the case. I think. Upgrades, they help to a certain point, but only up until the point that there's an organized guild that comes by. Because if you're not there to defend it, I don't think it matters what amount of upgrades you have. Any small guild of, of even 10 people can probably still take it down. And, and Kang of Kang points out that supply is still the real limiting factor on all of these upgrades. It costs a lot of supply to upgrade these keeps and towers, and, and if you don't 
pr protect your Doliax on the way, because that's the only way the supply gets to keeps and towers. You can't bring it manually. You can't drop it off. So you have to protect your Doliax. And if the enemy is shutting that down, it doesn't matter if you've got a benefactor with millions of dollars that's just bankrolling you with gems. It doesn't matter because the enemy's still going to shut you down. So anyway, okay. So any any final comments here on World versus World? Because we spent like an hour on this so far. <laughs> well, clipping was still a major issue. I really hope oh. to see that fixed. I mean, can you imagine that Golem video without the clipping? You know, um, it was a little depressing to see that. There were still issues where I was taking entire, uh, you know, 20, 15 man groups, diving into the middle of an enemy Zerg, and we couldn't see a thing around us. Like we'd poured in, and it was like completely clear, but we knew there was like 40 players there. That was still a very real issue. And I'm running my brand new system now, you know, two 670 GTXs, uh, and still I couldn't see a, a single thing out there. Um, and it was really upsetting because anybody, even with a fast system, you're still having an issue where you can't see anything around you, and that's yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, they said they. St I mean, it definitely is way improved in terms of performance, though. This week, uh, this beta, I think everybody noticed that. I think I probably got twice as many frames in well, every situation. Well, that was that was because they were you were now using more than one core. Like the last beta, you only had one core being mm -hmm. used. And I think now, the graphics have, card is a graphics card has a higher load so far too. A little bit, yeah. I I all control deleted. Went to my task manager performance monitor and looked at that. It's not really being utilized the way it should, but it, they're working on it. So there's obvious progress. I think the biggest thing that everybody noticed was uh, if you went to your CPU usage, you were now using two two uh, cores on your processor. That was huge for everybody. I, yep. I, there was guild members left and right logging in saying this is so much smoother, you know, and that's because they all have dual or quad core processors. Yep. And that, that makes a huge difference. Absolutely. So, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll shut down the world versus world discussion here. We could keep talking about it for forever. There was so much good times. Uh, but, uh, let's see anything else. Uh, interface wise, we got a brand new, some of the interface changes we talked about last week. We were able to put those into perspective. Um, did you guys enjoy the, the new dodge bar? What did you think about the interface changes or any kind of other systemic changes there? We'll, we'll throw in the whole traits discussion into this section too. Any, any thoughts that come immediately to mind? Did you like moving the, the mini map around <laughs> and making it bigger? Vega. Great. Um, I like I, the the mini map kind of confused me at first because it was like it's it wasn't like a square it was like this little tiny rectangle it's like I can't see crap on that but then I realized you could make it bigger, um, but I like the new dodge bar because it's very clear as to how many dodges you have or how yeah. close you are to having a dodge. Exactly. Um, I sort of take back what I said on the whole trait system being not broken but just being a lot more limiting and in that it really wasn't that much more limiting. I mean, all, all, I only played Engineer um, the entire weekend, so they have other problems in themselves. But, um, <laughs> we'll get into that later on an yeah. Engineer show. <laughs> but um, it should be pointed out that ArenaNet has stated that they're trying to rework the Engineer a little bit because they, I think they recognize that out of all the classes, the Engineer has the most issues right now. Um, yeah. Well, um, that in the garden. And, there, and there's, and there's going to be people who say, oh, engineers are overpowered, blah, blah, blah. I, no, they're not. They're, the engineers aren't overpowered. Well, I um, think that, that, that really ties into uh, some guy posted pictures. I don't know how truthful these are, that he was talking to John Peters in game. And it had his name and everything in it. So I'm assuming they're legit. And he, what he said is that there are only like two or three builds that work for every single profession in the game right now. But they want to make it so there's a lot more. And I think mm -hmm. what happened with Engineer, this is definitely, definitely apparent with Engineer, you can only do like one or two things with the Engineer and that's it. Like everything else doesn't work. And like what yeah. they have to do is like actually make the Engineer work with like other stuff and like actually be useful. Yeah. In a lot of but, but like with the, with the new trade system, I still felt like, yeah, there was, I, there was definitely some customization. It wasn't just doing cookie cutter builds. You could kind of like play around with things. Whether or not how effective they were is another story, but... Um, it was just good that you could do hybrid builds and you could still do the specialized builds and you still have as restricting as I thought it would be. All right, Vega, thank you. Uh, now, what did you guys think of the new chat system? I didn't hear any complaints. Everybody loved the, the chat bubbles. The local chat was great. And the map-wide chat was perfect. I didn't see any problems. Did you guys notice any problems? It still irks me that to press forward slash T to talk to to my team uh, goes oh to a tell God. instead. Do you know how many whispers I sent out by accident? <laughs> so it was cuz you know I'm trying to work with everybody on the server, you know, like hey, we're going here, we need you to go there instead. And I was sending whispers to the last person that I just talked to. 
Um, it was aggravating. I, they really need to do s something about that. Slash T. Slash I mean, T slash should be team. Yeah. Slash R is to reply, yeah. obviously. Slash W is to me a whisper, you yeah. know, and that does whisper. But slash T right now is also a whisper. Um, it's like you know forward slash tell, and I understand it stands for tell, but you have a team chat now, so I almost think that the team chat takes priority over the tell. I, you I, know, since I, you already have a W. Yeah. I don't know, but they should they should make every every type of chat should have a shortcut. Yeah, like, and right now the team, unless it, unless I was missing it, unless it's some other letter I didn't realize, but right now team, you actually have to physically type out forward slash team. And I thought maybe and, it was slash T E would get you there, but no, you have to type out team completely. Yeah, and when you're when you're in the middle of trying to take care of something, even, especially because that's the same system as in structured PvP, right? You have to yep. slash team. So if you're trying to organize with people that aren't on Teamspeak with you and tell them, you know, get to the clock tower, I'll take the mansion or whatever, you don't want to have to. Start Stop and type out slash team. You want it to be as fast as possible to get where you need to go. So I'm thinking like maybe because a lot of people are making a mention. I played EverQuest as also you know as well. Slash T was tells back then. It was all tells. There weren't whispers. There was tells. Um, you know maybe slash S for like server chat because I mean who are you talking to? You know in, in mm. team chat you're talking to your server. Maybe something like that. I, I just that's one of those things I see being somebody's going to type something out they didn't mean to and <laughs> and it's going to go to the wrong person it needs to be uh, that was the only thing with the local chat now local oh, S chat is squad is uh, gear gears powered fool points out s is squad so you can't do server okay well then that won't work um, <laughs> I, I i but the thing is when you do slash t don't you immediately have to follow it up with somebody's name yeah uh, yeah, you, well, it so depends. If you press if you press the arrow keys while you're doing it, then it selects the last person you were talking to. Oh, okay. Anyway, so, uh, so the chat worked out pretty well. We got significant f frame rate improvement. The trait change. Uh, let's let's pull up the trait answer. Uh, did you guys see the answer? This was on the Reddit AMA last week. That uh, was <laughs> what they answered with this ridiculously long. What is this six point post? And they did it basically a minute and 30 seconds after the question was asked. I think they knew it was coming. <laughs> oh, yeah, they were ready for that one. So basically their answer to the whole trait criticisms was as follows. The best builds were all 30, 10, 10, 10, 10. There was always a super strong trait in every line, which made every player put only 10 points into that trait. Uh, the system is so much... The, the new system, point two, is so much easier to balance. Um... In addition, uh, opportunity costs are what makes interesting choices. Trait tiers allow us to split the traits. Six allowed in slot one, et cetera, et cetera. And what that means is that the final two tier tre three traits are er elite-like in the sense that you can only ever have one of them on your build at once. Uh, and so you got to have to make that opportunity cost choice. Which one of these am I going to take? Uh, before, any time a character went with 30 points into a line, they'd be taking the same three, maybe three out of four traits as any other character that went three traits in. Um, not only this, option shock. New players at level 20 were clicking on a trait line for the first time and seeing 12 options, which is very overwhelming. Of course, this is, again, trying to uh, you know, not overwhelm new players. Now, the final point, and I think actually rings fairly true, putting 30 points into a line left you with a climax of picking the third most interesting trait in a line, which didn't feel very good. Uh, you know, when you get to the first point in a line, you're like, well, I am definitely taking, you know, arcane power because that's an awesome thing or arcane shield or whatever the, you know, the arcane awesomeness that they have in the elementalist tree. And, and then when you get to the third part of the line, you're like, well, what do I want left out of these other things? What's my third favorite choice? Uh, and, and that does kind of ring true. So having seen all of this, great. What was your initial reaction? And when you read this, did this sway you one way or the other? Or did playing the game sway you one way or the other? Uh, my initial reaction, actually, to this whole trade thing was that I have to see it in play before I can talk, like really start talking about it. And so I read that. I'm like, all right, I still got to wait to see it. And what I felt was their last point about the like the climax of it and picking going down the, the trait line was definitely more valid because like the first few are all right, the middle ones were got better, and then usually that that thirty point one was always like sort of like the big hitter, like sort of like the defining. Uh, trait line trait major trait that was a lot of traits so and I felt like they, they kind of did their job with that but they still have a lot of work to do with like kind of shuffling things around because sometimes you would get the 30 and you'd be like well this really isn't the two of these traits really aren't that great and they're 
and I wish I could go back and like you know get more traits down here because this would be better with this. Yeah, Vega. with my. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, freelancer. I was just gonna say with with the traits, I um, it was it almost forced a lot of the guild members, I think, to, in world v world, um, think about like builds, like okay, this is my level one to twenty build. This is my level 20 to 30 build. This is my level 40, you know, to 60 build. Um, and it was the way the way it was working because you had to unlock traits in World v World. Um, now in structured PvP, I didn't dive into much of that this weekend, but it almost creates sort of a, a meta in itself where you have to think about this is the build I'm going to have for starting that's most efficient. Like for Mesmer, it was an illusion build because the first two traits I could unlock was uh, Fury for Phantasms. And 20% illusion damage, you know, right there, both unlocked at level 1 to 10 or 1 to 20 was huge, you know. So I, I ended up specifically building around that for my level 1 to 20 with a, um, a scepter focus, which gave me the number 5 uh, phantasm, and my greatsword, which gave me the number 4 phantasm. And both of those did insane amount of damage because I had them both traded. And then when I got to level 20 to like 40, I ended up trading more into a crit build and dropping off the illusions um, because I was given access to more crit-based uh, traits. It, it was quite interesting. That was just my little tidbit on that. Okay. So, Vega, you mentioned that uh, you, you were originally very irate about it, but um, did this did, – did, did you read this and did I, it, like, calm you down well, at I, all, or did you have to play it to really change well, your Well, no, mind? I, I needed to play it, um, but I think I, I have a – a biased opinion because I only played engineer and the level 30 engineer skills were most of them were not very useful at all. <laughs> and so it was like a couple elementalists the, felt the same way. I'm like, why would I ever take that one? And some of them I was like, well, I tried playing with one of them. The other one required me to either have like signets or, or something on it that I wasn't using in my particular build. So I was like, well, Maybe I don't even want to go to the 30th point in this line because these two things are useless to me. But I did want a third that was back in the second tier instead that would go with my specific build. So, yeah, yeah some of them were I, just I mean, like, I, tr I tried, uh, like, oh, all I did was just do PvP, and I was just doing Engineer because I was determined to try and find something that worked. And I tried a turret build. I tried a gadget and bomb build. I tried a condition build with elixirs, and I tried a rifle build with mixing in some more gadgets and all this other stuff and all, every time I just felt like that the traits that I was trying to go for they're all over the place so it, like at least for the engineer I, I again I didn't play the other classes I was just doing PvP but I felt like it wasn't a clear well if you want to go turrets you clearly want to go this trait line like yes you do have to do that but then at the bottom there's like another 30 point trait that you need if you want to go a turret build because it's that good but so now you have to go 30 lines into two and now now you're back at 10 so it's like oh well i got 10 points well what the hell am i going to use it for all right i'll just take some elixir crap i just felt like <laughs> i just felt like I, engineers definitely need work and it's been stated but i i guess i didn't get I, like i said i'm not as irate as i was originally um yes there's less builds but i think it is a good system that they changed it to you I, I don't feel restricted um, and I'm just glad that there's still some play with it, and it's not just cookie cutter builds. That's the only thing I don't want. I just don't want. Well, if you want a turret build, you got to do this, and if you want this build, you got to do this. I like being able to play around with it and try and find new things with it. Yep, absolutely. So. Malkier keeps linking. He posted a th thread talking about the problem with the turrets not working really well. Well, well, you know, these are things that we'll talk about a little bit more next week. We're going to be uh, having some of our, our, our specialists in structured PvP join us on the show. We're going to talk all about structured PvP and the class balance and how it's working out in the maps and things like that next week. So definitely, if you guys are interested in that, stay tuned for that next week. Then we're returning to a normal Saturday schedule next week at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Sunday is what I meant to say. Ignore that previous. <laughs> the last guy was lying to you. He was fake. Um, yes. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, let's move on a little bit to uh, discuss a few of the things in structured PvP. We're not going to go deeply into it, but I just wanted to uh, see if you guys uh, noticed this issue. The thief. Oh, it's okay. We're just going to fit. Where'd he go? Wait a minute. Where'd he go? He's around here somewhere. 
Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. It's okay. We can finish him now. Nope, he's gone. Okay. Well, we can't stop the finish anime. He's stealth again. Um, he's around here. There he is. Okay, we found him right away. Now certainly we'll be able to finish him because he came. What the hell? That's no. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So, there, so there annoying. Is, there is one counter to this, and that is Kill make him. sure that no, make sure that the thief is your friend and in your party. Or yes. Like separate teams. <laughs> We found that out. Just like the guardian on every single one of your points that you have. <laughs> no, because a, a Rob and Team Legacy was with me, and we were just partied up so we could join each other in PvP. And <laughs> he couldn't figure out how I was immediately killing him. Like everybody else had exactly the problem shown in that video. They couldn't find him. They couldn't see him. He would he would disappear, and I would immediately see where he went. I'm like, well, I don't know whatever he's complaining about. This is easy. <laughs> Finish him <laughs> off. And then we figured it out because he was in my party. That's the only reason it was working. So yeah. yeah, they also um, you guys. I'm sure everybody's going to hear about it soon enough. But there were ways to almost perma stealth you, and in some mm -hmm. cases you were perma stealth. Uh, we had team legacy groups running around uh, that were that were basically trolling enemies <laughs> Ergs by by taking five people and engineers. Actually, Vega had a huge part in this. Um, mm -hmm. You could either do it with thieves or engineers, and they would go around in the middle of these groups, rezzing people in the middle of a zerg that just steamrolled this group. Uh, it was amazing. I was watching them and watching them, and my mind was blown. And I was like, <laughs> you know, Mesmer could do a lot of things, but I can't do that. <laughs> and uh, it was it was incredible. I, was, I ended up all tabbing out of Guild Wars 2 to watch their stream as they were doing it. It was just great, great trolling because they would go up and you could res people while you're stealth. So <laughs> they had 60 seconds of stealth and they could, you know, re reinitiate it at any time. 60 seconds, Bridger. Yeah. And um, and then they were just going around resing people nonstop and you couldn't do anything about it. As long as they didn't do any offensive damage, they were still stealth. So they were going around resing, resing, and then we ended up implementing it to see, okay, how can we use it offensively? So um, I'm creating a few videos of the of what we did actually, but we ended up creating strike teams to attack siege equipment attacking us. There was a 50 man zerg from um, uh, forget the name of the server. It starts with the M, but uh, Maguna uh, that was attacking us. They they wanted their garrison back, so the entire group at the end of Sunday night kept attacking, 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 setting up catapults, and we would go in this stealth party to take out every single piece of equipment they put up. <laughs> and there was only about ten of us, and there's this 50 man zerg that's like, "Where's our siege equipment going?" You know, because as soon as we took out the equipment, they would re-stealth, and then we just sit there, like as the entire zerg says, "How did this die?" It was incredible. <laughs> Wait a minute, it was... doesn't doesn't attacking the siege equipment break stealth? It does, but then you immediately restealth. Oh, <laughs> so okay. As soon as Smoke as soon as you screen. burst down the as soon as you burst down the ballista or catapult, then you restealth and you just stand there. You know, you can move, but you can just stand there as people are like, "Where do they go?" You know? And and for it what it's great. worth, this is exactly what the betas are for. We're supposed to be finding these things. The developer said, "Yes, we've noticed that <laughs> we've noticed that stealth is stacking in duration, which is not intended, uh, and they're working on fixing that." So so they, that's already been posted on the boards. They know that's that's an issue, and they're they're gonna fix it. Uh, maybe for next beta. So just like uh, just like our crazy Mesmer portals no longer uh, break the server uh, this time, uh, it prob they'll it probably they'll probably fix the whole stealth that things. we couldn't break the server anymore. Yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> not much for that. Um, like they're working on the game now. The other thing about structured PvP that I noticed that I was working basically all day Saturday, whenever I got in there and there was a guardian on the other team, I was just like, game over, we Peace. lose. <laughs> Because what was happening, and this is, I talked to a guardian that was running one of these builds. If you stack all plus healing equipment and stuff, it works so well. It has like a, a, a one sixth um, rate, a, 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 a 0.125 uh, rate that it stacks with the passive healing that the guardians have. So every tick you're getting one-sixth of your total possible bonus healing in addition to your normal regeneration. In addition, anytime you do your special heal, you get another huge boost to that. And, in a, and then the Guardians also have so many things that make it so that's... And they have, you know, protection, you know, things that reduce damage by 33%. There's this... The one Guardian that I was talking to had 12,000 health which is way low for any character in, in, at level 80, is normally like 14 to 18, unless you're an elementalist or maybe a guardian, because guardians are actually low health too. But he had 12,000 health 
Three people pounding on him with him not even fighting back could not kill him. He would regenerate faster than they could damage him. It was ridiculous. And <laughs> it was very yeah. mind-numbingly fear infuriating. Uh, so I got to the point where if I saw a guardian standing on a point, I just waved at him and went somewhere else. Because <laughs> you can't kill him. You can't even knock him off the point. It's ridiculous. I, when, when I was doing like some, some tournament matches, it, we didn't have a guardian on our team because we just kind of like threw a team together. Like, oh, let's just go try this. And if we saw, there was one team that we fought that had, they had two guardians. They're like, there's no way. There's absolutely no <laughs> yeah. way we're going to be able to win this. I think I think a team of three guardians could probably win in the current beta environment. Just against sitting a team on a, of just five. sitting on a point. Just by sitting on two points. Yeah. yeah. Easy. I, I I really I I you know what I kind of want to see them put into the PVP is some sort of way to actually get experience from it, like in the normal PVE sense, so that you level up your character. Um, I think that's counter to the idea of the structured PVP. It's supposed to be a, a separate thing, um, but. I don't know. I, I don't think they will, but I'm not really against the idea either. I don't really care all not that like, much. Not like a ton of experience, but just something so that like if you play it all day, you get a little bit of a level on your normal character. But that's just um, me. And, and they, they noticed that there were some issues with the glory ranks not working properly. Uh, they also I also noticed when I was looking at the tournament system that there was two options, a free and a paid tournament, which said that it was not available yet. So basically, it seems like you're going to be able to purchase these tickets, and probably in the gem store would be my guess, is you could purchase these tournament tickets, and if you use those to enter a quote-unquote paid tournament, you'll get actually better loot, better gear than you would if you just enter the free tournament. So that's that's pretty interesting, or maybe something something else not quite the same as that. So um, let me see, anything else about the the structured PvP that we want to touch on here? I think that's that's all I kind of want to talk about. We'll talk more about builds and, and uh, class balance and things next week. Um, any final comments on that? No. Uh, a lot of good teams were out there. Um, I didn't have the pleasure of doing a lot of it myself, but... Um, from what I hear, the tournaments were really fun. They were very consistent. Um, but there was also a lot of players, too. So, um, you know, it seemed like the whole system, the tournament system they are setting up was really, really good. Well done. It was it was great yeah. to see it all of a sudden, you know, pop up. I didn't really go into a tournament game and immediately feel like we were just going to get stopped. Like, we always had, like, a fighting chance. It yeah. wasn't... They, they, ma they matched you up against good teams. Yeah. It worked out pretty well. But I know, but I, but we never made it further than round two or any game, any team. It's I was also, on. it's also a totally different environment if for anyone that did like any structured PvP compared to like what you do the hot join. I, I think that's what they call it, where mm -hmm. you just like join in and like it's eight v eight and everyone has a great old time like running around <laughs> trolling each other, and then yeah. you go into the tournament and it's just like a totally different environment. Like people are doing things and there's crazy stuff well, going yeah, on. Well, th there would be like right, right from the get go in the forest of Niflheim. Um, there were there were people in the tournament doing things that you never see in the pug, like sending somebody immediately over to the boss on your side of the map, whether it was the chieftain or Svanir, and trying to steal it, like stealing yep. Baron in League of yeah. Legends. There was always somebody like trying to snipe it on the last second with some kind of a crit shot or something like that. Um, and and that that happened a lot more in the structured PvP, exactly like you're talking about. It's a very different animal, and and it, it's coming along pretty well, but obviously still has some issues. Um, so let's jump over to. Uh, to, to, to the, the PvE realm of things. And why don't we start out by taking a look at this. Let's talk about the last part of the event. Uh, the finale event of the PvE, which took place in the Ashford Plains. What you saw right there was, in fact, the Shatterer flying over Ashford Plains. And this was a really cool event. I saw about three or four... Uh, Reddit threads basically saying, okay, ArenaNet, you have to make the finale an actual game mode. That was awesome. And so, who, who participated in that? Great. Vega, were you guys there? No, yeah. it's too, uh, too late for me. Oh, no. All right, great. Tell us, <laughs> tell us how, how it broke down. What was going it on was, with the finale? It was, first of all, late, but I think everyone's read about that by now. Like, they had a problem launching it, I think. Some servers didn't it? even launch, and some, yeah. like, launched, like, my yeah, but what ended up happening when you finally get into it, apparently um, it's, it's some lore-related thing, but the, there's this thing called the Brand. It's like some sort of corruption, Are right? Are you talking about Kral Katorik, the crystal dragon? When he yeah, flew yeah. over 
uh, the from when he awoke and flew towards the crystal desert, everything he flew over became corrupted with this crystalline sort of corruption, and then they became his creatures, branded creatures, they were called, because they came from the dragon brand. And uh, the Shatterer is actually his lieutenant. That's what we saw flying overhead last night. And so, go ahead. That, that's the, the backstory yeah, there. Yeah, so, like, they took that backstory, and they said, oh, let's do something with it. And they literally made it so that... The, like some of the waypoints were becoming like corrupted and like players could become corrupted and then you'd have to fight against players and then I think who was a Ritlock and Air showed up in the zone and he had to like protect them but then the corrupted players had to attack them and it created these really crazy scenarios where like it was pretty amazing just to be doing PvE content like dynamic events with with other players with like different abilities and stuff yeah. it was crazy and, like, they would ambush you. Like, they would just come out of nowhere, like, hey, we're here. And it's like, oh, God, they're coming for us. And then this, this, the, it got really crazy at one point. Like, really, like, the minute the servers were about to go down, like, we oh, were getting yeah. ambushed TL or something. TL started getting, like, split in half, it looked like. like yeah. we, we were like, okay, TL, we're going we're gonna to protect Ritlock, and we're going to win this thing for the good guys. And then we start seeing members of TL on the other team that had been gone down and not said anything. And, like, Armstrong's over there. I'm like, no, Armstrong, what are you doing? We were your friends. <laughs> and then, oh, that was so much fun. It was basically, for those of you who have played the, the game modes in some first-person shooters, like the zombie game mode, where if the zombies, like, one player starts the zombie and if he bites you you join his team and now you're a zombie and the goal is to try to like survive as the human player the last one surviving or something like that so it was kind of like that but you also had to ritlock an air running around trying to help you destroy things and they would flatten things by the way <laughs> level like 85 champions of awesome they would insta kill anything they came across <laughs> so they didn't really need any help from us players to be honest but uh, I hope I hope they put this in for like holiday events or like special events throughout the year. This kind of doing something like Darkademic that. Darkademic says he <laughs> saw Kai great. got corrupted. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that that was so much fun. And the, like you said, the corrupted players got a different skill bar and they got new things that they could do. And uh, somebody posted a picture on Reddit. It was I can't find it now, but it was uh, this is what happens when you are corrupted and you try to swim and they turn into like a branded shark. It's like this shark that has these crystal <laughs> things growing out of it. It was awesome, awesome looking. Speaking of sharks, oh my god, there's like a great white in the in the Jared and Fields thing. We were running around and trying to get different things. We go in the lake, we're killing stuff. All of a sudden, I turn around and there is a shark the size of a Cadillac, like on my face. <laughs> like, like, oh god, ah! it was. Oh man, that was that was one of those moments um, <laughs> that I had. That was just amazing. It was crazy cool looking because that thing looked real. Damn. All right, sorry, I freaked out there for a moment. <laughs> Bad Deep press. Did you need a bigger boat? Whew. I don't know. Freelancer, you had everybody following you around the finale event there. I kind of wish it had some kind of um, actual end to it rather than just, okay, game's over. Like, there should have well, been a winner it did declared. Have a, it did have an end, though. The, the end was um, you had to take out all of the crystals. Um, you know, what, what I, I ended up zooming out looking at it. The way it works is that you have these champion mobs that are going point to point to the waypoints. Um, if they reach a waypoint that is not contested, a.k.a. corrupted, then they make it corrupted. So you had two objectives here. You had to clear out all of the corrupted waypoints, which had these giant crystals. Now, if you were, if you were one of these corrupted, you could spawn at these crystals and, and waypoint you know, between them. Um, so... The good guys have to take out all the crystals and the champions that are creating more crystals and basically claim the map. There is a bar you saw teetering back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, the corruption level. And if you got it, and some servers did, if you got it oh. all the way to uh, empty, then you won. It was, you, you, that was and it. And that you bar won. represented the number of corrupted waypoints? Is that what that represented? Yep. So every time ah. you took out a crystal, the bar would come a little bit closer to the good side. Every time a champion mob claimed a new point, it would go a little bit more corrupted. Um, and once we picked up on this, we, I, cause I had the commander icon above my head. I immediately said to heck with Ritlock, he can fend for himself <laughs> and started going crystal to crystal. But then sadly, you know, we, we hit about four crystals, me and my little Zerg there. And, um, it, we had great battles along the way, but then the servers went down and I was like, man, this is, they got something here. You know, they got to, they've got to do something like this for live or even next beta. Um, there are just so many 
I can imagine like things, a special you know. event, like they just bring that out randomly without telling anybody some night. It's just like, oh, well, this area just got corrupted coming in, and it's just crazy. Well, uh, you know, Ritlock had that woman, um, the Air. the female char. What Air. was her name? Air? Wait, no. Yeah, you know, Air was Air, Norn. Air, Air, somebody's going to Air Stagalkin but... is the other member of Destiny's Edge, uh, the Norn. Is that who you're there talking was, about? There was another... Uh, char female of some sort or just a char that came out and you had basically two people you had to defend but when we rushed over to air or, or it started with the e as i remember yeah air air and, is the norn it's not a char it's 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 a norn but air air and, and ritlock was okay. the two that you had so to defend. it's air air the norn so not a not a lore guy i'm sorry but <laughs> <laughs> somebody does a freelancer so you does not off, equal we, lore lancer <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, I was like, all right, TL, we need to go over it because there's this new person. Obviously, she's all by herself or he's all by himself. And we got, you know, uh, the other corrupted, which I knew half of our team legacy guys were corrupted at this point because they were popping out a channel. We had a dedicated uh, corrupted channel. And so I'm like, we got to get over there before they do because obviously if there's a massive Zerg of 40 people attacking air, it's, she's going to go down or he's going to go down. We go over there. I, I got there myself first. I had speed buffs and stuff. And I'm looking at air wiping out 20 people at a time. And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? This is pointless. And I'm like, no, guys, don't even worry about this. Let air take care of this crystal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so what ended up happening is it seems like uh, Ritlock and air, they're not there so much for the corrupted to kill them, but they actually act like what the champions do on the opposing side. Mm -hmm. They go around crystal to crystal taking out crystals, but at a much, much slower pace. At least that's what I was getting from it. Because it was impossible to even damage Ritlock. I watched 20 people, corrupted people, half of which were TL, come over a mountain, make me run like all heck, and I watched them like, oh, Ritlock's going down, and all of them got one shot with two skills by Ritlock. Um, so <laughs> that might it not just have seems... been balanced quite properly, but yeah, the, the, I think it's because once you got corrupted, your health pool was a lot lower. You became like a normal mob compared to a player character. Like You became an NPC, <laughs> basically, yeah. which is but, awesome. Uh, I don't think any of us can disagree on the fact that it was incredibly fun and it was very short lived and I could have done that for another six hours straight easily. I, oh yeah. I say I was gonna say um, that any it, it, what it, what would have been awesome is win or lose if everybody who participated who never got corrupted but actually did participate and kill corrupted players but you know didn't get corrupted. They should get an achievement that last past beta that says uncorrupted, you know, survived the, the corruption of the astral plane. <laughs> and the people who did get corrupted should get, like, join the dark side or something like that. You know, that. Uh, Team Fortress 2 had similar. <laughs> Do you have the little halo? Oh, yeah, yeah the I halo got... for the no hacks. Yeah. But they also gave out medals for people that played since beta and things like that. So I thought that would have been really a cool touch to, to even put above that. Just as the a little badge warrior. of honor. Yeah, just a badge of honor. I was there when the Plains of Ashford were corrupted yeah. by the Shatterer. So now the big question, big question here, uh, Bridger, do you think we would have ended up winning or losing? Um, you know, that's that... tough to say because we had TL on the other side too. Uh, and, and it kept going back and forth. It was not, it, it was not di going in a specific low or high direction. It was, it was chaos because you couldn't even see them sometimes. They would just be there and they'd clip it out and you're like, They'd oh. pop up. Yeah, <laughs> it's tough to say. I I, I would not I, put I, money I wish, either way. I, I wish they did it like just a little bit earlier, or started it earlier because yeah. I I can't it stay up incomplete. that late. It felt incomplete. It felt incomplete I can't stay up too. that late to do it, and I've, I I love those events because I like they're like a little surprise and it breaks up the normal like yeah it's fun doing world v world and PVE and PVP, but it's always good to have that little thing to kind of like break it up and something different that you know is unique. But it sounded like yeah. a lot of fun. So. Let's move on a little bit here. Uh, I, I took a look at the crafting system a little bit this a uh, little bit closer, and I'm going to be putting together a video for you guys in the next couple of weeks detailing how the crafting system works because it's got a lot of very particulars to it, and, and it it's a, takes a little get, getting used to if you're used to other crafting systems. So I'm going to put that together. But one of the things I noticed is while I was, like, using up all the materials that I would gathered over the weekend, I had, you know, all the different trophies and, and materials and, and, you know, soft wood logs, green wood logs, whatever, um, I wound up with a ton of weapons that I, I was leveling up an artificer, and I had a ton of magical weapons that I had no use for, like level five tridents. Just how I, I how do I hold all these tridents? I don't know. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> why can't I hold them all? And I had nothing to do with them because nobody was going to buy them. They're level five tridents. I don't even know if they would have bought them if I got to the higher level stuff. Um, so I came up with two options. You either salvage them and use the salvage materials to make more <laughs> tridents, <laughs> or you throw them into the Mystic Forge and you get something that you might actually be able to sell at the auction house because it seems like if you throw in four lower level items it'll stick it'll, it'll it'll give you one higher level item in return i think freelancer you said you were trying checking this out a little bit yeah i actually sort of uh, um exploited it to the point where i sent in a ladybug on it um <laughs> the the weapons and stuff that people were bringing into the auction house um like especially like level five stuff like you mentioned level five trident or whatever i actually bought those in mass and if you take four similar items, level, let's say level five tridents, using that example, and put them in the Mystic Forge, you will get an equivalent quality, like we'll say blue or green, at your current level. So what ended up happening is I bought out like every level five weapon and piece of armor I could find. And it didn't matter if it was one silver or two silver, you know, because at that point it was worth it. I put four of them in the, the Mystic Forge, get a level 40 item, and then start mailing it out to people that said they wanted it. Um, so for you could either go up to a World v. World vendor or go to, let's say, any random vendor and buy a green, uh, let's say, a green weapon, okay, a green great sword for anywhere from 20 silver to 50 silver, or depending on which one. Or karma, for that matter. Or karma, exactly. Or you could go to the auction house, which I was already there buying everything, and buy four great swords at level five for, let's say, 60 copper a piece, put them in the Mystic Forge, and get yourself a brand new shiny green great sword at level 40. And, uh, and you know, you just spent, what, four silver, if that, you know, and. I was like, are you kidding me? Does this really work like this, or did I pop? <laughs> and, and, I, and I started doing it over and over, and I'm like, this is really working. Like, they've got to fix this, because what's the point of going to a vendor if I could just do that in the auction house? Because there was a never-ending supply of people right-clicking their inventory on the, on the item, selling into the, you know, the auction house and not setting a price on it. So it would be like 60 copper. I, and there was, I couldn't buy enough. Like I was filling up my bags. I had 14 slot bags, and I was just filling up, filling up, filling up, and then sending it to guild members that just hit level 35 or just hit 40. Um, it's, it was interesting. Now I didn't catch too many other recipes. Uh, apparently, there was a lot of secret recipes you could get. Did yeah, you, are, did you guys are, have any luck in getting any of those? There are deterministic recipes that they have mentioned, where you know you put in X, Y, Z, and A, and you will get automatically be i mean my guess is if you put in like four of the same kind like four great swords you'll probably get a great sword back whereas if you put in you know a great sword and a bow and a piece of armor and something else it'll probably be more random a little clarification though Malkiar said that he threw in four blues which remember blues are like uncommons they're the step above above yes. white uh, he threw in four blues that were around level 20 to 25 this is when he's level 28 he got a green level 50 out yep. I so proc greens I, a lot. I don't think it's based on your level. I think it just gives you something automatically that's like a certain number of levels higher than the things that you put in you know, it probably averages out all the levels of the things that you put in and then says, okay, 20 levels higher than that, here's a thing, or whatever. I don't know what it what I, I don't know about averages. There's got to be some variables there because I was level 40 and getting level 40 items off of level 5 items. So well, I'm no, not sure. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying any yeah. character who's level 40, it does because I was level, uh, okay, so maybe there is some variables in there because I was level 24. Five ish, and I threw in um, a bunch of like five to ten stuff, and I got back a level twenty eight something. Um, so, yeah. so I'm guessing that that is no. I was actually level thirty or something when that happened. So yeah, um, yeah. There's definitely some some variable in there, but it doesn't appear to be necessarily based on your level, is what I was trying to point out. Because Malkior is level twenty eight, and he got back a level fifty item. So it doesn't just give you something that's your level. It gives you something a certain number of you put in and there's probably some variable as you mentioned but that's definitely an interesting system and it's a good way to get rid of gear that maybe nobody a lot of will people, buy yeah and a lot of people on chat are saying that they were getting different level items than what they had so you know then that's probably the case um you know it, it seemed I, I i gotta be honest i wasn't sending as much stuff to guild members as much as i was salvaging it and then selling the better salvage materials for profit <laughs> um, but uh you know because if I, if I bought a bunch of level five things at 60 copper a piece made a level 40-ish item and then salvaged it for the silver or gold ore that came from that item. I could sell that gold ore for, you know, 
uh, four silver a piece and make profit. Um, but it's uh, th it was interesting. I I don't think there's any ever been anything in any MMO previously. Uh, while WoW, even WoW, which you know steals, it seems like it takes ideas from every game nowadays, where you can take low-level items or crafting items, Bridger, and actually have a use for them, you know, and and make something out of them. Because now it's not so much a big deal if you're level 80 and you just started crafting, you now can actually still craft and do better. So, but, uh, is that coming from my house? No, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor overseer cat. <laughs> He's upset. No, that's the that's the other cat. That's overseer's kitty. kitty. Overseer? Yeah, the oh. kitten. <laughs> ah, overseer's overseer. Overseer kitten. <laughs> ah. The chat room just exploded. Now we're gonna get like thirty more viewers. I heard there was a cat on this stream. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to everyone. All right. Um. So. The other couple of things that I noticed, dyes no longer come from seeds. That's very interesting. You now simply get dyes automatically when you pick stuff up. Like when you loot a mob, boom, you've got dyes. Um, and when you uh, have it, it's unidentified dye, and that can be traded on the auction house. But as soon as you identify it and it says, you know, this is sunset red or whatever, um, you can't trade it anymore. And that's something that kind of surprised me because I was imagining going to the auction house and being like, oh, well, I want Sunset Red. Let me just look it up on the auction house and buy it. It doesn't appear like that's going to be possible. Does that rub any of you guys the wrong way? I like the old die system of just – because now aren't um, – so they're character bound. They're not account bound, right? Yeah, they're character bound now instead of being account bound as well. And one of the arguments that the developers made for this is what this does is it creates an individual palette basically for each of your characters. Well, this character got a lot of green, so I made some cool looking things here. And this character got a lot of blue, so maybe he's a blue character. I don't know. Um, that's, that's just one of the arguments that they made. Um, I, I don't really know which way to feel about it. I'm not a very aesthetically minded person, but I'm sure there are a lot of people that are upset or, or, or happy about this change. Um, it definitely seemed like it was easier to get dyes if you don't have to go to bring a seed somewhere. That's the first thing I did. I had a, a like I had turned a seed in and got a little receipt that said, you know, come back to me w tomorrow and I'll give you your dye. I didn't do it last beta weekend, so it was still in my inventory. I go to my home district. I walked all the way around the damn thing trying to find the stupid seed guy, and he was <laughs> gone. So he, he took my seed, and he ran, and he never gave me a dye. I want my damn money back. <laughs> <laughs> So. We put in a bug report for uh, the fact that we still had about 60 die seeds in the guild bank. Um, like, they didn't delete them. You know, did you guys notice Somebody that you had any you items that... you could double-click on the seeds and it would turn into a die. Did that not work? I, I hope that's not the case, because we just lost <laughs> a ton of dies. You just destroyed them all? <laughs> I just I thought they were gone. I, yeah, so that was a fail on my part, apparently. But... Uh, yeah, we just lost uh -oh. sixty uh, something dies oh, there. The chat room is like, all yeah. the colors, no. <laughs> the colors. But did you see the, the did That's you see cool. the Reddit post where um, somebody had collected about a hundred ninety two yeah. dies? Wow, um, yeah. that was insane. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big big aesthetic person, but I like to make sure that my my great sword and everything and my my clothes match. And uh, one thing I was a little upset upon is how many customers how much customization did you guys experience as far as the way your armor looked were you able to like pick and choose like armor pieces for yourself because uh, i i found that i had the same look from the day i started beta to when i ended last night when i was um, doing um in pvp you know you get like because you got like the random chest that you open them and it's got random gear in that everything i found i couldn't use it was either light or it was heavy and every now and then I got like a pistol or like a shoulder piece. And I was so Vega, happy. weren't you listening? Just throw that stuff in the Mystic Forge. You'll get with something good. <laughs> I should have. And the, they, they, they confirmed the click, right? I believe I read that somewhere. Yeah, they're going to add it. It might not come until after launch. But that's one of the things that they're going to add. And that's the one thing I was going to say. I was mainly looking at stats whenever I got new gear. I didn't want to bother like putting it on and then you know having it bound to me and then not be able to sell it or whatever. I guess I got to salvage. I salvage anything anyway, so that doesn't matter. I just because it's the beta and I didn't care as much. I didn't, I wasn't looking for, to try and use a transmutation stone or anything like that. By the way, is there anywhere to get a transmutation stone except the gem store now? I didn't see it on any of the karma vendors. I I had a 
90 something of them um you get them from the mystic chest oh um, okay and when you get them you get five of them at a time so like mystic chest i'll tell you what what comes out of them you have about there was about 12 to 15 different types of like potions that change the way you look like script you, you saw the videos yeah, you know yeah, yeah. eagle and all that everybody knows about that the biggest thing um it was it was completely overpowered and and i say it because it, i was using it and i just felt like it was way overpowered, was a 25% move speed boost for one hour that you could use in World v. World. Um, <laughs> I, I popped those, and it didn't matter if I had buffs on me or if people were buffing me. I could dash across the map in, in an insane amount of time, and everybody else, even the Rangers, who have all these move speed buffs, were having trouble keeping up with me because I had a permanent 25% uh, speed buff. And on top of that, in the middle of combat, I could kite the heck out of anybody attacking me. Mm -hmm. um, it was insane. And, um, you know, that was something I got out. There's there's a lot of crafting boosts. There's a experience boost. There was a karma boost. And there, these are all one hour. Um, there was a uh, magic find boost. I didn't even know magic find was in the game until I got one of those. Mm -hmm. um, there was a 50% chance of better magic find or something like that. That was interesting. Um, there was the experience said that there was karma, and then there was one other. I can't remember what it was, but I think it was crafting. Pro, uh, proc Solstice or says like that. you can buy those run speed boosts from the gem store. It should also be pointed out that the run speed boosts themselves, the name of it says 10%, but the description says 25, and it actually gives yep. you 25. It's, it's possible very much they're 25, changing yep. it to 10%, and maybe they just didn't get around to it. I don't know. Uh, but uh, Solstice says yeah. you can also buy those directly from the gem store. Um, Let's see. Yeah, you. Um, it was very much 25. Like it's very noticeable. Whereas 10%, you know, not so much uh, as much. But uh, th we'll see. What else was there? There was the mystic picks and axes. You I was could get telling mystic you about. keys from a mystic chest, which is interesting. Yep. Um, yeah. Let's. I'll give you an example. Uh, actual rates. I opened up 20 mystic chests. I had 20 keys. Unknowingly, that I would still have. 13 keys after I opened those 10 those 20 chests. So what is that about 60 65 percent chance at least in my on your investment that's your a key. lot higher than I thought it would be. So um, that was really interesting. So I ended up having to buy another 15 or so chests before I used all 20 of the keys I had. Um, <laughs> you know and so you know it's little I things hope. like that and um, the boosts were were very notable i mean you could buy an experience boost and i was trying to do all the math and i put it all in these little notes that i have here but um you could buy an experience boost for about 250 gems it seemed to be around there and there's these different boosts anywhere from 250 to 350 uh to 500 but if you bought one key 125 gems you had a chance of getting a any of those boosts or multiple of those boosts in one chest so it almost seemed to me that aside from the bank you know expansion and um you know, the other little extraneous things like bag expansion and stuff, um, that it's more efficient to buy just a bunch of Mystic Chests, which, by the way, we're only running about 20 copper a piece on the market, um, and then buy a bunch of Mystic Keys and get your boosts and stuff via that way because you're going to get a lot more of it. You get, like, two, three boosts. You get a, a potion that changes you the way you look. You get all this extra stuff. Um, oh, another thing is instant repair canisters. Mm -hmm. I got tons of those. I had uh, 20 of those. Not really a big deal, but, you know, people could use them. That They are useful if you're well, out in the middle of world. Well, let's ask Freelancer, the guy who was naked in our last Dreaming Bay video <laughs> at the end of the raid, <laughs> how useful it would have been at that point. <laughs> yep. And then uh, it seemed like just uh, there were – it seems like there's a tables, like drop tables, mm -hmm. you know. Like I got only two of the bank, like the instant access bank item, whatever that was called. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I got one of the, uh, the auction house uh, items. So it just – it just seemed overwhelmingly like you got more for your money by opening Mystic Chests, which I guess is a good thing because of the you know everybody was debating whether it was worth it or not. And you get then the, actually and the buying the boost is, individually. You do get keys from things like I got a key, a Mystic key from completing a map. Like you get tons of stuff if you want to you know really do well in Guild Wars 2. As you go through each zone in PVE, complete everything, get every heart. Get every uh, unidentified, you know, point of interest. Get every waypoint and get every skill point in a zone, and you are re basically rewarded with, I think, 50 to 75 percent of a level, and you get at least a half a gold for the first starting zone. This was, and then you get four awesome items, and it's either really good loot, or it can be a transmutation stone, five of them, or it can be mystic keys. You get a ton of stuff for completing a zone, and you remember, there's like 
30 zones in the whole game or 40 zones. Yeah, so you, I believe the complete zone, defining it to all our viewers, that is getting all of the waypoints, mm -hmm. getting all of the points of interest, and do you have to get all the little hearts You also have too? to complete every heart, and you also have to get okay. every skill point. So this, so that's basically a completionist uh, wet dream. Yes, you, know, you get tons of stuff from that. <laughs> yeah. In okay. addition, but it's of not, course... But it's not, really, it's not really like that overwhelming to do that stuff, though. No, it's, it's fun it, doing it that stuff anyway. It just kind of flows. It does. Yep. And it's not yeah. like grind. I mean, I never felt like grinding. I mean, the the heart things were a little bit tedious ish, but um, th they they usually were kind of interesting and fun and different. And that's what I kind of liked about them. It wasn't go here and till kill ten rats or whatever. It was okay. I need help, you know, because of this and this. And a lot of the time, a dynamic event would spawn nearby that would give you credit towards helping a heart quest. So it didn't ever feel like you were oh, I don't want to go to this dynamic event because then that doesn't add to my heart for my complete completion, you know, thingamabob. So I, I, I felt everything flowed really well. And we, we were just running around. I was running around. I think it was um, eye drops and a couple other people. And we were, uh, uh, and I uh, know it was Lonnie we were running around with. And we just had fun trying to find every place on the map and get every heart and, and, and talk about, oh, man, look out the ghosts over here. They're going to get us. And, and we were just having a blast playing with each other. That was the whole thing. So. And then also the big thing to note about this, this encourages, let's say you level past the zone, right? You know, you're... Yeah, those you got, rewards what, are level based you don't exactly, actually so. lose anything by coming back and you gain a bunch you know if if you come back you're, you're down level to a point i think you're, you're almost all the way down leveled right mm -hmm. so if i'm level 40 i think yeah i remember going into the gendaran field something like that mm -hmm. um and uh i was down leveled all the way down to 20 something but um you get almost it seems like full experience for doing things and i was level 40 something at the time uh, and on top of that, it gives you encouragement to go to that level five zone or that beginner char area that we had the final event in and, and complete it, you know, because you get a ton of rewards, it seems, after that. So uh, it's it's ingenious. I, I love it. I, I feel that uh, that the system ArenaNet has, like, made really rewards, like, sort of exploration and kind of, like, go your own path. And like, I love doing you, that. Yeah, it's amazing. Like that's when I, what the the PvP I did over the weekend wasn't like I'm gonna go do my heart quest and personal story. It was like I'm gonna go gather wood, and I just followed like the trees I saw on the mini map, and I ended up at a dynamic event somewhere, and I started like doing that, and it was just like, oh, here's another waypoint. Oh, here's another heart quest. And it like lets you kind of craft your way through it as you want, mm -hmm. but then you can go back later and finish it up because you're down level to it too. S speaking of crafting, how many people mass leveled off of crafting? I oh, had, yeah. I had oh, guild yeah. members. I've I've literally had the roster open, watched them at let's say level 21, say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have all the mats I need. I'm gonna try to get to level 100. Crafting. I check not 10 minutes later after they crafted an insane amount of stuff, and they're four levels or three levels ahead. That was that's hmm. big. And what that tells me is that somebody theoretically with a ton of money could almost mass level off of just crafting if they like bought a bunch of gems and bought a bunch of things in the auction house and then just did nothing but crafting like they could actually power level themselves off crafting can you think I, about I that i saw a it's dev like, post the I dev like said that. the dev and said they specifically tuned the system so that going from level 0 to 400 in a crafting discipline would get you 10 levels and the idea being if you have the patience to go and get level 400 in every single one of the eight crafting disciplines, you can level from 1 to 80 doing nothing but crafting. Pay to hmm. win. <laughs> I'm... I heard pay I'm to on, win. I'm on, the, I'm on the fence about that one. There it is, folks. Oh, what's wrong with it, Vega? Come on. You don't be there's a nothing, party pooper. No, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with it, but I mean... <laughs> it's, if you want to, that's pay to win. This if is you Vega. Have, there's not nothing wrong with win. it, but there's something wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it's, it's not it's pay, to it's pay to win. Everybody says pay to win. Win what? The point of the game is to have fun. Is it pay to have fun? Yes, I paid sixty dollars and I had fun. If other people want to pay more money to have more fun, let them do it. It doesn't affect your game. I'm gonna go on you an know, impromptu bridge. It should be. It should be noted too. Will be world though, doesn't it? No. Like you're here's... a higher level in World Be World, you're oh, going to yeah, be doing better. Oh, yeah, but that doesn't better. matter. When you start the brand new character, you're going to be level one. Who cares? All right, I got to jump in and say something here. Vega, if you power level yourself to any level doing just crafting, when you step out into World V World, a level one is going to one-shot you, okay? Because of the way the tier system works. We had a higher level. We had a guild members that got to level 60 plus, and they were 
they basically neglected the gear. Um, some of them did. Some of them didn't. <laughs> they were still great. wearing level six gear. <laughs> but they were level well, level twenty, twenty five. Like they picked up gear along the way when it crossed their mind. Um, so they go out into World v World. A few of them. This was actually around level forty ish, and they were just like, "Why is everything hitting me for like nine k?" You know, and they were getting slaughtered by level one and stuff that were getting buffs that were increased their stats way beyond what this level 40 had. And the reason being is the way the scaling works is they assume that you're going to have level equivalent gear that buffs your stats to, you know, if you have level 40 gear, it gives you, let's say, plus 20 power, right? Mm -hmm. At level one, you're going to get gear that gives you maybe plus two power, you know? So they buff your stats accordingly. Mm -hmm. So your your buffs that you get at level one are far greater as far as raw stats than the buffs you got at level you know forty or fifty. So you know pay to win the idea sounds great, but unless you pay to win and also pay to buy all of your gear and you step out in the world big world, it it almost seems like a level five that has all of his skills unlocked is the most powerful vanilla character well, you could have. Don't forget, in World vs. World, there are karma vendors that, and remember, you get karma for taking keeps and defending keeps in World vs. World. So if you can easily, and I had tons of karma that I didn't wind up spending, and maybe I should have spent it more on the karma vendors when I saw them, and they will sell you, you know, level appropriate gear for karma, if I'm not mistaken, but there are also people in there that will sell you level appropriate gear for, you know, green gear or blue gear. Usually it was blue gear, I think, um, that you could get for, for, for level appropriate stuff. Um, and here's another point uh, that talked about crafting. Here's another dev post, uh, the importance of crafting. Quote, there are stat combinations that can only be acquired through crafting. It's also the best way to get the highest stat gear in the game. The three armor making craft, uh, craft the best slash largest bags in the game. Cooking buffs are good and the only way to get the best buffs with the highest durations. All that said, there is nothing that requires you to do it. Crafters can post their wares to the trading post, and you can buy them from there. You don't have to be a crafter yourself. What he's saying is crafting is the easiest way to get the highest stat gear and stuff in the game. In addition, um, the, the, the cooking one makes the best buffs and all this other stuff. So that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. So, I had so, a, why, a random... so why do you have a problem with leveling up in PvP, but leveling up by just simply crafting is okay? I don't have a problem with any of it. I like leveling up, and I like that everything you do in the game levels you up, honestly. Except for, well, PvP it, doesn't. PvP it doesn't, eh, I don't really care. Be, be, because, <laughs> there you go, I'll tell you it's why. Just, it's the I'll, same I'll tell you why. Because if they level up via crafting, they're buying my crafting items. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's a major bias in this house right now. <laughs> um... So one final thing, I think, before we, uh, we basically call this a night here. Somebody was, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like the new glory system where you get random boxes of things that you can, uh, fair enough, they're account bound, so you can put them away in your box and, 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 and you can use them on other characters. But sometimes you get a bow that you don't, oh, I'm not going to use a character that has a bow. Why do I care? Um, this is from, I believe, John Peters, who said, quote, I can try to elaborate a bit, but it's still in progress. Basically, there will be a method to or, or, or break down unwanted items. There will then be recipes with those pieces that can create specific items that you are looking for. He's specifically talking about the Mystic Forge. You're going to be able to break down PvP gear, throw it in the Mystic Forge with a very specific recipe and get a very specific result. So if you say, I want this set of PvP reward gear, because you went and looked at it and you, you know, control clicked it and saw what it looked like on your character he's like this is how i want to look you can look up the specific recipe and make sure and get it so you can break things down and you can turn them into um i don't know let's call it scrap metal then you can take that scrap metal and you can turn it into refined metal you take that refined metal and you add like a little token and you can turn it into some kind of a helm or a hat is that how this system works <laughs> this sound familiar to anybody else <laughs> You know, it was a little annoying that if you went to structure PvP and you wanted to do both, like we had members that were structure PvP and then they jumped to PvE in World v. World. Did you notice that your structure PvP items got thrown into your bags? Did any of you guys yeah. notice that? Yep. Yeah. And, and that vice was... versa. There, there was a interesting thing with the stuff you got from the chests and by the glory vendors. You could yeah. put that in your locker. You can put that in the PvP locker. It's similar to the deposit collectibles. You can just right click yeah. on and deposit it to the PvP locker. Yeah. But then, like, the stuff you buy from the vendors and all, like, the runes and stuff, so, like, if you're, like, playing around with builds and trying stuff out, 
that stays in your inventory. And like, there was some wacky stuff. I just stuff destroyed where... them. I just destroyed them because you can buy them for free. They're yeah, zero you can buy them again. I had, then... I looked in the in the PVP chest. You have two hundred and fifty copies of every rune in the PVP chest. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then there was some wacky stuff too, where like, where you're if you're in structure in the hearth and the mists, you can't touch any of your PVE items in your inventory. So like, if your inventory got full, because I'm terrible at inventory management, it got full every time. <laughs> and I want to go like, oh, let me just get rid of this like stupid like talon that I have sitting around. It's garbage. It's junk. I can't do anything with it. Until you I can't right click on it. It's like no. Nope. Yeah, I couldn't do anything. You're with in it. PVP mode, man. What are you doing with that <laughs> PVE stuff? You can't do with that here. Exactly. Yeah, I had a I had a derp moment with uh, one of the the guild, the entire guild correcting me where I was having an issue storing all my iron ore. Um, and so you can only like I think it was like a thousand or something you could have in the stack. And I was filling my guild or my not the guild bank, my own bank with it. And they were. It wasn't until like I think Sunday afternoon that people were telling me that there was actually a collectible tab that you could tab over and put all this stuff in. So I'm like, <laughs> great. No, well I, well, I got excited. I'm like, great. I can deposit. You know, this 13k iron ore I have in there. Like, like I was imagining from Guild Wars One. If you guys played Guild Wars One, they had a great little tab where you could deposit all your crafting materials in mm -hmm. it. It was, it was awesome. Like when I. I had played WoW for four years, played Guild Wars 1 for two months, and thought Guild Wars 1's system was 100 times better. But So I got excited thinking, okay, I could deposit everything I have into, uh, into the you know, little collectible tab. Turns out the collectible tab can only hold 250 of any given item. Well, Freelancer, um, who is going to have more than 250 copper? Well, no, copper? no, no, no. Let, I mean, <laughs> you're going to know. On a given day, Bridger, you'd have 250 copper. Come I on. I didn't even get 250 copper over the course of the whole game. I got like maybe 100, which I then refined down and used in crafting. And I went to every damn node I could find. I just didn't buy it off the auction house in lots of a thousand. <laughs> okay. This right, is for right. normal Fair people. Uh, I'll take that back. But, uh, but what about like the collectibles? <laughs> Did you guys try to look at the mini pets and stuff at all? Like, no. We made it a I point to. I hate those things. Well, I bought like <laughs> I ended up buying all the mini pets and, and giving them to all the guild members we had this big mass mini pet spree and it turns out like on the collectible tab as well it seems like both in the pvp collectible tab like where you put your weapons in and your unlockables and also the mini pets slash the other categories there they don't include like lower tier mini pets and stuff so if you collected um dredge something there was a dredge mini pet which was a blue mini pet, or actually most blue mini pets, if it wasn't green or yellow, then you couldn't store them at all. And <laughs> so somebody that wanted to collect them, so to speak, um, you couldn't actually collect all the blue ones. I'm and I sorry. Know, I know you're loud. I know why you're laughing. But uh, I'm sorry. But when you Your have mini pet is too to spend, low level for this thing. bank. <laughs> <laughs> Your mini pet isn't rare enough to be stored in our vault. Thank you very much. <laughs> so what ended up happening is, you know, after we got all these mini pets, I realized I can't even store them. You know, we gave a mass mini pet giving away. Um, the, a lot of the mini pets. Did you did you check them out? Did you hear them, Bridger, at all? The flying mini pets had a horrible glitch. I hope Arena Net's listening and everybody ladybugged it. But there was a lot of flying mini pets that had obnoxiously loud flapping of their wings, like a noise. <laughs> so if you turned them on and you got it synchronous with the rest of your guild members, we got like four or five people with it. You could epically troll somebody by walking up right next to them, pulling out the mini pet, and it just you have to take your headphones off. Like, it was the, the base of the wings flapping sounded like a dragon was right next to you. <laughs> it was really bad. But, uh, yeah, a lot of good times in beta. Did you guys mess with anything as far as the auction house aside from that? Like, extra toys? Like, box of fun? What would you guys think about that? Oh, the box of fun. Box of fun was fun. It was just a box of fun. Like, it's, it it's, it is was as of advertised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fireworks snowballs. and the snowballs. Box. Oh, the snowballs. The, or the I one just... that made the the already gigantic Nornus. Yeah. Like I six play a Norn feet character. taller. <laughs> and when I got the giant, like, it grows you bigger. And I'm already the tallest thing in the game. So it's like, well, now I'm just everywhere. So <laughs> and I'm then the if you do a dodge, like, while you're that big, it's because it, it, you, you're still only going to go backwards, like, five feet. So it has you go in super slow motion as you dodge backwards so that you don't, like, just roll 16 feet that way. Oh, it was crazy. <laughs> for, for me, boxes of fun were, like, guild leader wards, you know, because, like, people would pick up snowballs and look for the commander icon. <laughs> I, there was times I got hit, like, 
20 <laughs> times in a row by Snowball. <laughs> that My own go was epic, like trolling the heck out of me. They'd wait for me to get up, and then another person was ready to hit me with Snowball. It, <laughs> it was so much fun. But, yeah, the boxes of fun in general were, were a neat little addition. I hope they do a little more quirky things like that. Yeah, they got to add more options to Box of Fun because that was great. All right. Yep. We more are fun in the fun box. We're coming up on like an hour and 45 minutes here, so I want to wrap us up here. Any any final comments on this weekend? Any stories we didn't get to? Uh, I do have a lot of other stuff in the show notes um, that I, I posted here, so you guys can definitely check that out. It's more stuff talking about from the, from the AMA um, combat markers, those orange so- cross swords in World vs. World, the AMA revealed that those represent uh, groups of six players or more that are fighting. So that's very useful information for everybody to know. I thought I'd point that out. Um, there's going to be at least one more beta after this one. We have that confirmed from the Reddit AMA. Uh, for those of you that didn't know, um, apparently John Peters may be able to outrun a centaur. It depends upon the breed. Good to know. That's another piece from the AMA. So if you want to check out all this, as well as all the links and everything we talked about during this episode, go ahead to talesoftyria.com, or if you're watching the YouTube video, you can check out the show notes right in the description of the video here. Um, so it's it's all there. I've got all that stuff there, and uh, we're going to talk more about structured PvP next week. And I guess that means that it's time to say goodnight to everybody. Good night. Whew. Deal with it. That was a long show, guys. <laughs> and we didn't even hit half of what we, we had. We really didn't hit half of what we had, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta let the wife come back in the bedroom. <laughs> Taking over the whole thing for the green screen here. <laughs> it's like, no, you can't come to your computer. It's being used as a light stand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> the ultimate. The ultimate. Uh, ultimate forever alone. I, I have to go. Be. I have to go feed overseer kitten before he. <laughs> claws something i don't want clawed so (laughs) (laughs) all right we'll see you guys later next week structured pvp discussion it's going to be great see you there So, What's wrong, Kira? we're done. All right. It's over? Yes, we are. What time is it? You know, it would have been interesting to talk about. I just read through the notes. I had no idea. Two sigils, sigils, <laughs> on uh, two-handed weapons. What was that? Did oh, you yeah, put that I in there, Bridger? Hang on a second. That's what they were talking about adding. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, like, I. When- handed weapons you got a you get totally different skills and stuff like that but all right say again what you were get you gonna two sigils i would can you hear me now yes uh, bridgers i hear you okay i was-